Good morning, everyone. Good morning, I'm Matt Ewalt. I serve the Texas Tribune as Senior Director of Events and Live Journalism. Uh, welcome to those joining us here in Austin in person and those joining us online for our program today titled, How New Laws Are Affecting Public Education in Texas. In 2023, much of the legislative debate around education in Texas centered on whether to allow families to use public dollars to send their children to private schools. But legislation and legislators also debated other public ed issues. And key legislation was passed to address some of the gaps in academic achievement in the wake of COVID's disruption. As we approach the end of the school year, we'll discuss today what has helped Texas children catch up with their studies, the lingering challenges, the impact of new laws, like investments in instructional materials, tutoring for struggling students, and accelerating advancement in math, and what else the state can do to help. We're joined today by Gabe Grantham, policy analyst at 2036, Sharla Horton, director of Texas Strategic Support at Education Resource Strategies, Jennifer Sines, senior director of communications and policy at E3 Alliance, and Gonzalo Salazar, superintendent of Los Fresnos Consolidated Independent School District. Our moderator will be Alejandro Martinez Cabrera, education and urban affairs editor at the Texas Tribune. Our program today will last an hour with 45 minutes for conversation and 15 minutes for your questions. Here in Austin, we have mics for our in-person audience and our virtual audience can also submit questions online using our Q&A portal at texastribune.org slash ask. That's texastribune.org slash ask. We are grateful for the support of our sponsors. Our major sponsors include Texas Association of School Business Officials, Methodist Healthcare Ministries, Philanthropy Advocates, Educate Texas, Raise Your Hand Texas, and Commit Partnership. Our supporting sponsor is Texas Association of Middle Schools, and our foundation sponsor is the Bertie and Johnson Foundation. On behalf of my Tribune colleagues, I also wanna thank all of those throughout the state of Texas who support the impactful journalism of the Tribune, including those who have become members. To learn more and to become a member, visit Texas Tribune org slash support. And tickets are now on sale for Texas's breakout politics and policy event, the Texas Tribune Festival, which returns to downtown Austin from September 5th through 7th. Join us for three days of unforgettable conversations about the issues that matter to Texans, including public education, at our annual celebration of big, bold ideas. You can purchase your tickets at tribfest.org. And so now let's get to our panel. Gabe Grantham is policy analyst for Texas 2036, working on a range of issues in the PK through 12 space, including virtual education, teachers, curriculum, early literacy, advanced mathematics, and accountability. Before joining the organization in 2021, he spent three years with Teach for America, teaching high school science in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Jennifer Cavazos signs as Senior Director of Communications and Policy at E3, where she spearheads initiatives aimed at fortifying the nation's educational pipeline to drive regional economic prosperity. Prior to her tenure at E3, she held the position of Director of Strategic Partnerships and Outreach at OnRamps, a program led by the University of Texas dedicated to bridging the gap between high school and college academic expectations. Gonzalo Salazar has served as superintendent of schools in Los Fresnos since 2006 and has extensive experience in bilingual education. During his tenure as superintendent, the efforts of Los Fresnos staff have been rewarded with student performance that has consistently surpassed state and regional averages. And as director of Texas Strategic School System Support, Charla Horton serves as project director for the Texas Strategic Resource Use Network. Her work includes planning statewide network convenings and building partnerships with mission-aligned organizations and new district partners across the state of Texas. Most recently, she served as senior director at the Commit Partnership, where her primary areas of work included high-impact tutoring policy, high-quality math pathways legislation and impl implementation, excuse me, and increasing access to quality middle school seats across the region. 
Our moderator, Alejandro Martinez Cabrera, is the Education and Urban Affairs Editor for the Texas Tribune. He previously worked as a digital editor at KUT.org, breaking news editor at the Austin American Statesman, and content editor at the University of Texas's Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas. I thank our panel and our audience for being here in Austin and, and joining us from around the state this morning. And with that, I turn the program over to Alejandro. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, everybody, uh, our uh, audience and our panelists for being on a rainy day in Austin and for everyone joining us online. So um, let's, let's start uh, painting a picture of the situation where uh, we are in academic achievement in the state of Texas. Uh, we want to focus our conversation on a handful of laws on that area uh, in specific, but uh, uh, we, we had a pandemic and uh, that pandemic had an impact on our uh, uh, students' academic performance, uh, which has been uh, a struggle across the state to recover. Uh, we have made more progress in reading, but still catching up on math. So I know uh, a lot of you here have thoughts on math. And uh, I, for, for our audience and the people joining us uh, online, uh, I, like to hear from you uh, about the stakes for uh, getting children not only to recover to pre-pandemic levels, but excelling, uh, mastering the subject. Uh, what, it, what are the stakes for the state of Texas of getting, what, what is the point where we want to be uh, uh, in terms of uh, math attainment and what are, what, uh, what are the stakes in terms of for the workforce and just the future of the state? Yeah, well, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll get started. Um, when we look at what the data says in terms of achievement in the state of Texas, we have 52% of students on grade level in reading is lower in math at 45% of students on grade level. Um, when we think about what that means, that is, we have to truly sit with the fact that over half of our kids are not where they need to be in mathematics. And as the goal of the education system, we need to be making sure that they are prepared for life after high school, whether that is their career, whether that is college, and later on, are they able to have a family sustaining wage in the state of Texas? We know that as we look at the industries that Texas is attracting, we are doing some really incredible stuff in the STEM field. We have a booming space industry. We have tech here. We need to make sure that the Texas students are prepared for the workforce that is here. I think when we think about the actual workforce that we have, we're having to import a lot of talent out of state. When we look at um, our domestic migrants in the state of Texas, they hold 1.5 uh, times the number of bachelor's degrees than the, than the average Texas workforce. So if we're wanting to really set our kids up to be successful in this 21st century workforce, we need to make sure that they are on track to be able to enter college, attain degrees, um, and math is such a strong predictor in that. And so hence the continued need and investment in it. Yeah, I mean, just to give an, a, a deeper example, and it's more specific just to Central Texas, just to give you some numbers, but in Central Texas alone, in the next three years, we're anticipating about 20,000 jobs just in um, advanced manufacturing alone. Um, and right now in Central Texas, we have a little over 300 students that are on the pathway to be able to have the skills to take those jobs on. And so that means that these industries are going to have to go outside of Central Texas, but what we're finding is that they're not just going outside of Central Texas to other areas, they're really going outside of our state, and oftentimes they're going outside of our country to fill those jobs. And so we really have to think about what are the skills that we are providing our students, and how are we building that foundation so that they are successful beyond high school um, for that credential that certificate and or associate or bachelor's degree. What we have seen through our own research with E3 Alliance is that students who do not attain any sort of post-secondary uh, credential and or degree only have a 12% chance of earning a sustainable living, 12%. So when we say that college is not for everyone, we really have to change our rhetoric there. Four-year college may not be for everyone, but post-secondary has to be for every single one of our students if we're going to set them up for a life of a sustainable living and success. And what are the odds uh, of us getting uh, uh, children to take these on these jobs uh, as we stand right now? Uh, 
let, let's talk a little bit of uh, what needs to be, uh, wh where we stand right now and what, we need, what needs to be done. Uh, uh, Charlotte? Yeah, I, we talk a lot about um, the lack of proficiency in reading and math, but I think when we start to think about post-secondary opportunities, we also have to talk about students that are at grade level proficiency, but are not being granted the opportunities for advanced math pathways, um, which is a really, really strong predictor of college entrance and post-secondary credential attainment. Um, one, as a former principal and teacher, one of the, my favorite um, roles was exposing kids to, um, and creating opportunities for them to understand all the different pathways, career pathways that are available and connecting those very specifically to core content. And math is a perfect example of that. Um, we, we have really, really bright kids all across the state of Texas. We have really, really bright kids um, in every single district. And I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that those really, really bright kids, that number one, that we know who they are, where they are, and make sure that they have opportunities, not just to um, understand what's available to them, but also that we create the pathways for them to attain that, which is, really what a lot of E3's work was on in the last legislative session around Senate Bill 2124, making sure that kids have access to the opportunities that we know they, where they can be successful. Uh, I definitely want to get to SB 2124, uh, but first I'd like to hear from uh, Gonzalo about that uh, uh, journey to recovery after uh, the, the, well, it's uh, pre and post pandemic. Uh, so, uh, your uh, your fifty percent of your students are at meet uh, grade level, uh, meaning that their their likelihood of succeeding in the next grade uh, uh, is good. Uh, so and and that is uh, I, I think uh, at the state average is forty three percent. So doing a little better than the than the state. Still, you know, I'm sure the rest of the panelists and a lot of people uh, in Texas want you know all our kids to be at that meet grade level or better. Uh, uh, but tell us a little bit of what the uh, the journey to uh, recovering in, in, in math uh, looked like at Los Reznos. Thank you. I'll start with um, um, just singing the praises of the teachers who champion the cause for kids each and every day. We are, there are great things happening in our public schools and, and our teachers are very passionate and very dedicated. There's a lot at stake. Uh, it begins with helping students understand the world around them, using math, science, reading to understand the, the world around them, but also we are equipping them with the skills they need to be successful in their post-secondary endeavors. These need to be transferable skills, and uh, teachers have a clear understanding of what is at stake. I serve in a community where 80% of our kids come from economically disadvantaged uh, backgrounds, and uh, the high concentration, we have a high concentration of the fastest growing demographic in the state. Hispanic, low socioeconomic, second language, second language learners. So yes, we're, uh, we have a lot of work to do. We are at 50%. The journey, to get to your question, the journey began uh, during the pandemic, checking in on our teachers, uh, making sure that we were taking care of those who are taking care of our kids. If we're going to be successful in the classroom, the teacher has to be at 100%. And what we learned is that as much as we were focused on how the pandemic was affecting our students, we were losing sight of how the pandemic was having an impact in the lives of our teachers and taking care of their mental health and partnering with the United Way of Southern Cameron County to bring in uh, counseling for our teachers really paved the way for um, what, what was going to happen afterwards. And so since the pandemic, we uh, have assessed our current reality and we, we know where our goals are, and, uh, but having a clear understanding of where our current reality was uh, enabled us to put measures in place to take that step-by-step -step process uh, to provide prescriptive interventions for kids, Prescri the type of prescriptive interventions that uh, leads to every student showing growth and, and progress. Um, and of course, uh, we're always looking to maximize, maximize our resources. We are always going to have fewer resources, but we, um, we have this uh, concept in Los Fresnos where we save where we can so we can spend where we must. Yes, go ahead. I was just gonna add um, and push a little bit. 
Because um, when we think about math in Texas, I think we have to take a like good look at what is the actually history here and like what is historical achievement looked like. So we have a report, actually, Texas 2036 has a report out um, that we look at actually a holistic lens of, okay, what does all of the math data say? Um, and what are some opportunities for the state? And when we really looked at it, it's like a lot of our problems in this subject existed long before the pandemic. Um, you know, at the highest point, only 51% of our students were at or above grade level in math. And so I think that when we talk about what can be done to recover, I think we're limiting ourselves in terms of what solutions exist out there. Because if we just get back to pre-pandemic levels, we're still leaving about half of our kids behind. And I only say that because I think we can think and dream a lot bigger of um, opportunities to invest in schools and invest in teachers to support parents and support students at the district level. Um, and so I think that as a state, um, we can, we can dream a little bit bigger than just pre-pandemic. I was going to ask you about, uh, Gonzalo, about you, you mentioned specific intervention. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more? Because I want to hear uh, and, and discuss specific things that uh, can be done to, to try to, uh, again, not only get to uh, uh, where we were before the pandemic, but get children to uh, succeed in, in, in math beyond 50%. So it's, it starts with hiring the right person, right? Hiring the, the, the teacher is going to be the best resource that, that we have. And so hiring competent, passionate people that, um, and creating, like in our, in our school district, we created a, a talent development department to make sure that we're mentoring, supporting, placing teachers with the, and, and matching teachers with, with the kids that, that they need. But what we uh, uh, are, uh, what, the next piece of that is um, developing our curriculum. We have been writing and refining our curriculum for a, a number of years in, in Los Fresnos. And each year, teachers make notes as they deliver instruction, as they modify their lesson plans, they make notes about what is working and what we need to tweak. We take all of, we compile all of that information uh, and we bring it into curriculum writing projects. So each year we're, we're uh, modifying our scope and sequence. Uh, we're in an effort to improve tier one instruction. Before we talk about interventions, how are we improving tier one instruction? Are we challenging our students? Are we engaging them? Are, are, uh, is the, the material that we're delivering in tier one instruction rigorous enough uh, to bring our students up to the standards that, that we need. And then uh, we take a look at our students. First we look at ourselves, then we look at our students. Where are they? We uh, administer assessments and we um, analyze the data to arrive at where do we need to modify, modify our instruction. <clears throat> we make further adjustments to tier one instruction, but inevitably um, there are interventions that we need to provide. And so we develop through MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support, individualized plans for, for each students. And then we group and regroup students in order to um, maximize our, the instructional time and the resources that we have. And that, project, and that process continues. You, uh, uh, that process continues until uh, we arrive the at the student performance that we desire. So uh, I know here in the panel we have uh, some uh, data wonks, and uh, I've heard uh, uh, from uh, uh, people in the education policy world uh, uh, this focus on data, looking at data and uh, uh, catering solutions, uh, that uh, recommendations that can go to the ledge, that can turn to uh, 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 legislation uh, that is targeted. And uh, I've heard uh, uh, that that was the approach with Senate Bill 2124, uh, that uh, it requires districts to create uh, 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 programs to help eighth graders go into Algebra 1 um, and facilitate the transition for uh, uh, fifth graders into advanced uh, 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 placement in mathematics. Um, and I've heard the, uh, that this uh, people who are fans of this approach uh, and that this can be uh, uh, transformative in terms of uh, elevating math skills for, for students. Uh, Gabe, Jennifer, uh, Charlotte, would you guys like to comment on like wh why is it, what was this piece of legislation so uh, potentially transformative? Yeah, and I'm happy to start. Um, it, yeah, it was very transformative. Um, what we have seen throughout research, we've had a lot of emphasis in reading and not that we shouldn't. Reading is obviously very important, but what we're finding in research is actually math is a stronger predictor for both um, 
graduating on time from high school, college career military readiness, and then entering a career and or post-secondary completing with success and having a sustainable wage. What we also know through our data, um, through a lot of data, is that if students graduate from high school having completed four years of math, and more importantly with that fourth year of math being a college-aligned math course, so dual credit, AP, IB, on-ramps, um, you are four times more likely to enroll in post-secondary and complete. So not just enroll, but actually complete earn that credential and or degree, and they're prepared to enter the workforce and earn that sustainable living. When we looked at the data to understand who are the students are on that pathway, because if you recall HB5 back in 2015, um, remove the requirements of four years of math in high school. Um, and we wanted to understand how might this impact our student population when it comes to college and career military readiness and when it came to earning a, a credential and or degree and in moving into the workforce. What we saw is that most of not all those students had taken Algebra 1 in 8th grade. And then we wanted to see, well, who gets to take Algebra 1 in 8th grade? Well, what we understood is that decision is made for students in 5th grade. And there was not a consistent policy within our state of how those students were put on that advanced math pathway. And when we looked at who was taking Algebra 1 in eighth grade, there was a huge disparity between our black, brown, and our students from low-income households compared to their peers. So much so that we then looked at it by quintile analysis. So we looked at our star assessment scores in fifth grade, we broke it down into quintiles, and we said of the top first quintile, what percent of those students, so you're removing race, you're removing ethnicity, you're removing gender, you're removing economic status, and you're saying all of these students scored within this same um, score range on their STAR assessment. And the disparity was we saw 36% of our black students that were put on advanced math pathway compared to 95% of their peers that were white or Asian, even though they scored exactly the same. And so what we needed to do first is make sure that all of our students had access and opportunity to be put on the pathways that they were demonstrating proficiency to already be on. And so what the bill does is it puts a consistent policy. So you remove implicit bias, you remove inconsistencies across our state that says every student that scores in the top two quintiles of our state standardized assessment and a local assessment are automatically placed on the advanced math pathway in sixth grade that moves them into taking Algebra 1 in eighth grade, that really opens up that opportunity for four years of math in high school, but more importantly, that four year of math being able to be a college credit bearing math course that we know is going to quadruple their likelihood of moving into post-secondary for a credential, an associate or bachelor's, which we know will then move them into the workforce, set up and prepared to take on the jobs that are available within the region in which they live and earn them that sustainable living that we want for all of our students and families. The big barrier there used to be that uh, you, should, you, you had to opt in and now the it's, it's automatic now that you go if you, if you uh, score in that top 40% uh, of students, you go automatically into advanced uh, placement. Correct. As and to. what we saw in through our qualitative data, it was inconsistent. So you would have one district that said it was counselor decision. We then would go to another district, it was teacher recommendation. And then you'd have two districts neighboring that would use STAR as their um, cutoff, but even the cutoff score that they used was inconsistent. And so what this does is it helps our school districts understand how to identify students that are demonstrating proficiency and make sure that we're putting them on the math pathway that will challenge them and prepare them for the future that they see themselves in. Now, uh, another uh, big law that was approved was uh, um, HB 1605, uh, which uh, put down a significant investment um, uh, in the order of uh, 800 million, 700 uh, million, it's between 700 million and 800 million uh, uh, dollars to go into the uh, creation and, and well, it's, it's uh, to create a, a, a list of uh, high quality uh, instructional materials that uh, once they're approved by the State Board of Education, uh, districts can use them. And a lot of advantages were identified for, uh, for, for, for these. And I'm kind of curious uh, about the, to hear from you about the, 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 the hype for these materials and what, how they can uh, impact uh, the, the and, and change things for a lot of struggling districts across the state. Uh, Charlotte, maybe do you want to take this one? 
Yeah, happy to. Um, I remember my first year as a public school teacher, and I remember the exorbitant amount of time that I was spending developing lessons that were probably, in retrospect, not high quality. Um, I was a novice teacher with novice with novice level content expertise, yet here I was designing and delivering instruction for some of the neediest students in um, my district and across our region. Um, and I was exhausted and I was only marginally effective um, um, because of that. And when I look at HQIM, and I know there's lots of, lots of people who um, are averse to HQIM because it's canned curriculum or it's scripted curriculum, but it has the opportunity to do two things. Number one, um, it really helps to ease the burden of planning and preparation that teachers face, particularly novice teachers, and we have we're nearing record numbers of novice teachers in the profession. Um, and then number two, it creates this equity, um, it, it creates this equity in that every student, student it, it's not left to chance who gets great instruction. Um, and far too often, um, to Jennifer's point earlier, black students, low income students, students with mild to moderate disabilities and students who um, are multiling multilingual learners have the least access to really proficient and high quality teachers. Um, and so HQIM removes the barrier of um, low quality instruction. Um, and so it's a, there's, there's a benefit to students in that they get really great instruction in front of them. And it's a benefit to teachers, particularly novice teachers, um, because it creates um, the opportunity for them to spend their time on the right things, which is being in front of students, engaging with them, building relationships with them, and ensuring that they reach um, the appropriate levels of mastery of the content. I'd like to offer a slightly different perspective. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I think there's there's the good and the bad, and and when you have high turnover and lots a lot of new teachers, a scripted curriculum can be the scaffolding that you need bef to put in place before you build capacity. But um, I am concerned that uh, these high quality instructional materials, which are are all relative, um, <laughs> um, were being promoted as your teachers won't have to plan. And I mentioned earlier about how much planning and, and modifying of instruction goes on. I'm concerned that we would stay there. Um, it, it is only scaffolding for a temporary period of time. But I have learned through experience, through the lived experience, that it is in lesson planning where our teachers flex their muscle, where we learn what worked and what didn't, where we differentiate curriculum for the students who are in our classroom not what someone determined at one point in time, this is high quality instructional material. So having a quality curriculum in place is important, but also having mentorship, having uh, uh, instructional coaches and mentors. Uh, if, we, if we just thrust our teachers into the classroom, new teachers into the classroom and say, go get them, um, are, are, we're doing our students a disservice. But if we pair them up with a mentor, a, an instructional coach, quality instructional materials, if we sit alongside them during planning time, then we will build capacity. I'm afraid, um, and I, I've mentioned this to Commissioner Marath, that um, over time, um, if we're not careful, we're going to uh, regret not building capacity in the teacher workforce. Um, lesson planning is tedious. It's a lot of, a lot of work but it is where we flex our muscle. We're both, <laughs> <laughs> We're both ready for it. Um, I would just add to like, any time that we talk about teachers, we have to think about what does the teacher workforce look like today? Um, and how do we invest in that? We need to be thinking about like, how, do, how are we recruiting more teachers into the profession through really high quality pathways of training and preparation, but also addressing the fact that right now, so many teachers in our classrooms are in their first few years of teaching, right? Or uncertified and not gone through one of these high quality preparation pathways. I think when we talk about math, we have like 50% of math teachers, uh, they are in their first 10 years of teaching math. When you think about three, year three, you're about 30% of your teachers have three or less years in mathematics. And so I think we always say it's like a teacher really hits their stride their third year, right? Because you've um, gotten to go and look at those lesson plans, see what worked, what didn't work, um, 
And so when I think about what it means to invest in the teacher workforce today in terms of providing them the tools and the resources, yes, it is mentorship. Yes, it is prof high quality professional development in the classroom and coaching, but it's also providing them the tools so that they can be delivering high quality instruction on day one in class because that's what our kids deserve too. I, I, I agree. If I can dovetail on that, we are working with our um, institutions of higher ed and the teacher preparation programs to offer year-long field experiences for teacher, for teacher candidates um, where they experience the teaching profession a year in advance. New teachers are uh, getting married, buying a home, buying a car, um, learning the electronic grade book, uh, and sometimes even having their first child in the first five years of their career. That's a lot happening, male or female. Uh, there's a, that's a lot happening for them. So to begin, um, beginning to develop the teachers so they can be successful on, on day one is a shared responsibility that we can be even more successful if we continue to pair up with higher education. Yeah, I was just real quick, I just want to add, I think what's really important to hear when we, when we talk about certain policies and moving from policy to practice is none of these policies are the solution, right? They're starting to put us on a pathway. And I always say, we can have the best instructional materials, and if I hand it to a teacher that does not have self-efficacy and does not have the capacity, then it becomes the worst materials. And so if we don't take HQIM and understand it from, we have to invest in the professional learning and development of the teacher and not just hand them the high quality instructional materials and think there's gonna be now quality instruction, just along with SB 2124, right? It's about access and opportunity. And now that we're putting these students on the pathway, how are we ensuring that we are supporting the teachers and building their capacity, that they have the math skills and the efficacy to be teaching the concepts that students need to understand and learn to have the foundation that's needed to move into the workforce demands that's gonna be there for them when they graduate. Also, these uh, high quality um, instructional materials, uh, they're opt-in, right? The uh, districts can decide whether they implement them uh, or, or not. Uh, now that, that, that law was uh, approved and now we're in the phase of implementation, uh, uh, like Charles mentioning, you know, not not everybody is gonna uh, uh, want to implement them. Uh, Gonzalo is saying, uh, describing his curriculum and how it, in Los Fresnos you've been adapting and uh, uh, you, you, you're you're uh, you're you're getting where you want to with that curriculum on 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 it seems on your own. But I'm just quite wondering uh, in, in, for for the the districts that might want to adopt them or are considering them, what does a uh, successful rollout of these materials look like? What are the, now that we have a law, uh, what are the, the, the barriers, the potential hiccups? Uh, uh, can, can you guys comment on that? I mean, I think one of the, the important things to note is the main reason that this bill came into play is because a study that was done on the curriculum that was in most of our schools was two to three grade levels below what it was actually supposed to be teaching, right? So we knew that we had to level set and say, we at least need to make sure that the instructional materials that are in our classrooms are providing instruction at the right grade level. So we have to start there, right? What are our expectations of our students? And if I'm teaching fifth grade, let's make sure that my, my, curric my instructional materials are at fifth grade level. So I think that's really important. Um, so that's the advantage of this bill, is making sure that we just have quality instructional materials in our classrooms, first and foremost. For, first and foremost. But I think what Gonzalo was saying is really on point, that a, a really good rollout of this is going to make sure that what is that professional learning and development of our teachers as we're bringing in this new instructional materials into our classroom. And I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I started my teaching career, I was 20. I turned 21 a month later. So imagine, Sharla, the, the quality of teaching my students received. Um, and there is a lot of learning in the planning process. But the planning process has to be, in my opinion, with your other teachers, with your peers, right? Not in isolation. And so PLCs are really important. So we really have to think how we're restructuring the day. How are PLCs, we providing- can you define quickly for uh, those who don't know the actual Professional learning, learning communities. communities. I couldn't teachers, remember what the Teachers come together over uh, the content that they're going to teach and how they're going to deliver it. 
Right. So making sure that we are providing the time, the opportunity, and giving them the resources and tools, not just to put it in their classroom and start delivering instruction, but to also um, learn what the instruction is providing, and then be able to work amongst each other and identify, adapt it to our classroom and our student needs. Let me, I want to add to that. Um, one of the things that I think um, I benefited from the most in my classroom educator tenure was was PLCs, was this time of collaborative planning. But I think one of the greatest disadvantages was, um, you know, I was in a district that didn't have a curriculum. I was in a district where we were handed a list of standards. And so it's important to understand that in a state the size of Texas, we have all compositions of district with all different levels of resources. Um, I, in my first year of teaching, never once attended professional development that was content aligned. Lots of pedagogy. So I knew classroom management stuff. I understood some of the basic foundations um, of instruction, but I didn't know how to teach reading. I didn't know how to teach sixth grade reading. I didn't know the prerequisite skills that, that students needed to have. So the advantage that I gained from being given the resource, the tool of a really great curriculum was not, now my planning was purposeful. It wasn't just me figuring out a list of activities, it was me really internalizing and understanding what content pedagogy was, which was not something we talked about much. We talked about pedagogy, but there's a way to teach and then there's a way to teach math. There's a way to teach and then there's a way to teach seventh grade science, which is different than how you teach sixth grade science. And so the advantage that HQIM offers from my perspective is it focuses your um, planning in a way that is intentional and purposeful. Um, I also want to add that um, professional development is so key to your p building this capacity in teachers, um, but we also have entire districts that don't have a professional development department or a professional learning coordinator or don't have the internal resources to really structure um, a high quality professional development experience. And so, um, to Jennifer's point earlier, what we have now with HQIM, what legislation does is it gives us a framework within a path forward for districts to move towards best practices that maybe um, they didn't recognize or didn't have either the resources or the internal capacity to do on their own. Um, and so when we think about this very broadly, we're looking at not what's happening in one particular district, not what's happening in one particular region, but when we think about the size and composition of all of the different districts across Texas, we're level setting and we're creating these opportunities for every Texas student to have access to the highest quality education that they can have. The only thing I'd add to is like, when you're rolling out any practice, right? You have to recognize there's no silver bullet in education, right? And so you have to recognize these or are- Or cookie cutter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to, like, this is a long-term investment. It is certainly not a short term. Um, and so with that, I think it is bringing in the community around the decision um, to adopt any type of curriculum and to show, hey, we are going to have full transparency on how this is rolled out, bring you into it. Because if a parent looks at the at math curriculum adopted and says, I, what the heck is this? It's going to cause some trouble in implementing. And so not only um, ditto 100% invest in your teachers, develop them, help coach them in this curriculum and in this content so that they can become just more and more experts in their craft, but also making sure the entire community is invested in it as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, tutoring. Another of the laws that were approved uh, during the session was a uh, House Bill uh, 1416, which uh, walked back uh, some of the requirements on tutoring that were approved uh, in a previous session. Uh, uh, it's a, a uh, high impact tutoring, uh, uh, but requires, uh, allows to have uh, slightly larger groups, raising uh, the, the tutoring groups from, from three to four students and requires a, a, a little fewer hours. Uh, what, um, Gonzalo, why don't we start with you and talk about uh, the, uh, uh, 
well, not only the importance of tutoring, but this is also something that falls on teachers, and it was an additional strain that this this uh, law was trying to adjust and reduce that uh, that, that that strain. But uh, um, tell us about like th this this requirement, and uh, does it ease off the pressure? I, I, this, uh, yes, go ahead. First, I, I want to thank the Texas legislature for recognizing that a well-intended bill uh, had gone too, too far and, and kind of uh, locked us into what t tutoring should, should look like. Um, and uh, our teachers do appreciate having the flexibility of relying on their expertise. Um, after all, we, we are educating the, the entire child. And tutorial sessions need to be planned around student needs and certainly uh, uh, around data analysis. Um, but because we're educating the entire child, we need to understand how, what student interests are in our classroom. Where are their interests and how can we tie math to the music, to music where kids are really passionate about or, or science into um, uh, understanding the world, the world around them, as I mentioned earlier, um, so that a student looks forward to going to that tutorial and not doesn't see it as a one more, one more time that, that I have to sit in front of my teacher one more time and discuss something I'm, I'm not really passionate about. So allowing teachers to have the flexibility on how they design the tutorials and, um, and the frequency of, with which um, they can organize those tutorials was very, very helpful. So uh, grateful for that walk back of 4545, which we will always remember. <laughs> Uh, Charlotte, maybe can can uh, I'd like to uh, hear from you a little bit about the importance of tutoring. In again, we're trying to get students uh, uh, not only back to a place where we were before, but like Gabe is saying, like soaring and doing much better. So, how does tutoring help in that context? Yeah, um, I spent two years of my life working on <laughs> tutoring uh, implementation, and um, I think that. One of the one of the challenges tutoring offers benefits, I think, um, that have not been that we can't overstate. And I don't think that we focused enough on the benefit that high impact tutoring. And I'm not just going to say tutoring. I'm not just going to say tutorials. It's high impact tutoring, which is a very prescribed um, type of intervention, tutoring intervention, but. All of those benefits will never be realized without fidelity of implementation. Um, implementing high impact tutoring as it's defined was really, really hard. It was a heavy lift for districts. We're talking about fundamentally um, rethinking the way that we've intervened with students um, and enabling the, the conditions that were necessary for that implementation to, to be successful. Um, there wasn't a lot of space for that in the existing school day structure. Um, and so I don't think largely we have fully realized the benefit that high impact tutoring can offer because the burden of implementation was quite significant. Um, do I appreciate the rolling back of some of the uh, requirements of 4545? Yes. Do I wonder if rolling back the requirements of 4545 the way we did will yield the same benefit that we expected, that research shows us we can expect with high, with high impact tutoring? I don't know, because we didn't really do it. Broadly, we did not implement high impact tutoring as designed across the state. Um, I think that schools did the very best that they could with what they had, um, but we still have a long way to go in terms of really figuring out how to design and implement tutoring programs that are research-based, um, which specifically about the, the um, ratio of three to one, the dosage of three times a week for at least 30 minutes a day, the uh, qualification of you know a highly trained, not necessarily certified, but a highly trained teacher um, or tutor. Um, and, and until we get there, we can't really speak to the full benefit that tutoring offers, nor can we even get to a conversation about return on investment because the investment is not just the dollars, it's also the investment in a fair and uh, a, a firm implementation with fidelity. Really quickly, Gabe, because I'd like to touch something else before we go to Q&A. Um, I think too, if we are wanting, 
high quality um, tutoring to be really effective in the state, we have to be honest with families too, like where their kids are at. Like data shows us that nine in 10 parents think their kids are on grade level. And we know that it's 45% for math. Um, and so what does investment from um, the community again look like in this scenario? Well, parents are gonna have to drive their kids to um, different activities or be picking them up. If they think that they are on grade level and exactly where they need to be, they're not gonna be as invested in the um, program because why would they? Um, they think everything is fine. And so how are we as school districts and as a state being honest um, and being as transparent as possible to again, get the best return on this, stuff like that. So before we go to Q&A, uh, uh, I want to talk about unfinished business. And uh, I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you guys go uh, uh, one by one and, and comment. Uh, I think uh, we, we probably all want to talk about the governor's uh, uh, teacher shortage task force and the things that weren't done in that regard. Uh, that's one thing uh, uh, that comes to mind that is an important one. Uh, who wants to take that one? For, yes, we have a great roadmap. Um, I think that um, Governor Abbott's, Abbott's Teacher Vacancy Task Force um, laid out last session um, that I think gives the legislature a really clear path of how to be successful here. Uh, what does it mean to invest in teachers in the pre-service space, but also providing them coaching and training and development in the classroom? Um, and how are we paying our teachers more and keeping our best teachers in the classroom? I think that there was a lot of conversations like how do we increase the teacher incentive allotment to make sure that we are providing our absolute best teachers the highest wages that we possibly can so that they are in those classrooms for a long term. They see themselves teaching 10, 20 years um, and continuously honing their craft. And that's, I think, going to drive a lot of student outcomes um, in the right direction. Jennifer, unfinished business or things we need to do next session? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with what Gabe just said. I mean, we we spend a lot of time looking at the student and investing in the student and not enough time investing in the adult. And if we don't um, provide the adults what they need to be successful, then the student is never going to be successful, right? Um, so I would really hope that this next legislative session we spend some more time. We have to change the rhetoric of public education um, and really talk about the impressive things that they're doing. Talk about the work that our teachers put in and that if we don't incentivize them based on the quality of performance that they're providing, then we're always going to be struggling in that area. Um, I think with HB8, which is our community college finance bill, we're going to see a lot of great benefits. But one of the things that we know is that it's going to increase the number of students taking dual credit. We don't have enough credentialed faculty to even offer the courses that our students need to be able to take to earn the credentials and or associates or degrees that we want them to early on. And so we really have to look at teacher credentialing, what that looks like, what that means, and how do we create better pathways for our teachers to be able to continue their education so that they can be credentialed to offer those courses. I would say um, increase the basic allotment. Give us the resources that we need to improve teacher salaries, teacher retention, um, and uh, acknowledge that the fiber of our democracy is being woven in the classrooms in our public schools each and every day. There are great things happening in our public schools and teachers are doing great things. We'd love to see the leadership talk about the great things happening in our public schools. Yeah, he said money, which is exactly what I was going to talk about. Um, I think that um, chief on, on the minds of every senior system leader right now is the fiscal cliff that they're all facing. And the reality is while this is, yes, we knew it was coming. Yes, it's been looming for a long time, but it does not change the very the very stark reality that so many districts are facing with massive budget deficits. Um, we need to stabilize school finance in a way that um, we don't have these highs and lows um, so that the incredible work that's happening in districts with teachers can continue um, in perpetuity. Like there's gonna be so much abrupt end to many, many really, really great initiatives um, happening in districts because they don't have the funding to continue them. All right. Well, let's. Uh, uh, we have uh, a few minutes for Q and A. So uh, yes, yes, we have um, a mic here for those in person, but also you can ask your questions at TexasTribune.org/ask. I also just want to acknowledge during the intro, um, I butchered the name of uh, Texas Association of, of Mid-Sized Schools and want to acknowledge uh, their support uh, today. I will also just ask, since we already have a line forming here. 
Um, make sure your questions end with a question mark um, and that we're able to get to as many questions uh, as, as possible. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Daphne Hoffacker. I'm a parent of a high school student here. And I wanted to actually just sound the alarm. My student is one of those probably few students who are ready for high math. He does not want to go to school in Texas. None of his friends are looking at school in Texas. So be aware of that. There's an impact of the culture wars that are happening on our, in our state on our high school, thoughtful, intelligent high school students. So be aware of that. My real question is, what... Uh, what impact does um, like star test planning at the kindergarten level have on math? Because what we noticed is our kindergartners are coming home with worksheets when it seems like they should be, you know, playing and doing all the developmentally appropriate things they should be doing. I'm wondering what the long-term impact of that is starting in kindergarten. Great question. Yeah. I think uh, <laughs> I think it's hard to say about long-term impact. I think you know it takes me back to kind of that uh, educator prep programs that we we're talking about, really um, identifying high-quality teachers in our classrooms. Um, just to give you an example, I started as an elementary teacher. I needed one math course in college in order to be certified as a elementary teacher, and so we really have to look at our K-5. How are we providing content? driven professional learning and development to our teachers so that we're building on their content. We are coming out of these EP programs with pedagogy, with theory. We need content specific professional learning development. It needs to be ongoing. And so how are we supporting and providing those resources to our elementary teachers specifically so that they um, can provide quality instruction in the classroom? I, I, I would add that a age appropriate uh, uh, instruction um, is key. Uh, understanding that the state assessment does not does not define us and should not drive every decision. We have to be uh, planning for the delivery of instruction beyond those measures that are tested in the, in the state assessment. Anything be less than that will do uh, our kids a, a disservice. But we also have to acknowledge that uh, the metrics, uh, the measures and how they are implemented and how testing is used, which was never the intent, um, how testing is used does impact the decisions that are that are made um, in, uh, at the ground level. Um, and we as educators have to have the courage to go beyond that and say, okay, I may not get that measure in the ninth grade, in ninth grade math, but I'm gonna put kids, you know, I'm gonna challenge kids in the eighth grade, in the seventh and eighth grade to take advanced mathematics, even though uh, it, there is a disincentive in the state assessment and the accountability system for those of us who choose to do that. Uh, your scores may be lower in, in at the high school in your first year of high school math because most kids took it. So all of those, all of these decisions need to be looked at. We need to be at the table and talking to the decision makers and saying this is how this metric is affecting what's happening in schools on campuses throughout throughout the state of Texas. We just also add, like add how can it be both and right? Like how can we both give kids like rigorous, true instruction around mathematics, even in those early grades, um, that does is absolutely developmentally appropriate. I think that we can think those two can be merged. They are not um, necessarily opposed. Um, let's uh, go to the next question online here. Uh, this person writes, several districts in our rural area have decided to adopt a four-day school week for the 2024-2025 school year. What are your thoughts on SB uh, 2368 and the impact of four-day weeks on Texas students and teachers? It's, it's hard, really hard to say because Texas is a large, a very large, very diverse state. The, di the dynamics in every community are, are different. Um, I can tell you that it's not something that we're considering in, in our school district because, again, who we serve. We can't forget who we serve. The parents are working shift work. The parents are going to have to make arrangements for, for child care. Um, there's only, and uh, in, in, we've looked at it in our opinion, it, it is, there's only so much that a student can take in a day. Lengthening the day uh, may, may not be the answer for us. More, more time and quality interaction uh, um, during that time that they're with us is uh, where our focus is. So it works in some communities. It's, it, we, we just can't paint everybody with a broad brush. The needs are different in different corners of the state. Good morning. 
I understand this is a high-level discussion of education policy in Texas, but I'm disappointed that there really was no mention of special populations, whether our growing numbers of students who are learning English or our students with disabilities. Uh, speaking of math, for instance, we all know that students with disabilities, for instance, in fifth grade uh, proficiency, barely a quarter are meeting standards. Um, so my question for this panel was, what can we do to close the gaps for our special populations, including students with disabilities? Yeah, I, I can give an, ex an example of SB 2124 and how it came to fruition. So we actually studied the opt-out policy in Central Texas for the last five years. In the last five years, we've, also, we've actually increased our emergent bilingual population on an advanced pathway by five, uh, five times um, with the opt-out policy. And so what we were finding is that our special population students, our EL students, were actually demonstrating proficiency in math performance, but yet weren't being identified and put on the right math pathways um, because they were being overlooked. And so we know that that particular legislation is going to elevate and put a spotlight on the students that are demonstrating proficiency that are in our spe special populations as well um, from that standpoint. Uh, please, please forgive us for not communicating clearly uh, the multi-tiered systems of support and the prescriptive instruction um, that we talked about uh, in, in our dialogue here uh, was directed at exactly that. Every child, whether they are bilingual or special ed, um, multi-tiered systems of support is a, is a, uh, a system through which educators of different backgrounds come together at each campus to make sure that we talk about individual students and what that child needs, be it special needs or bilingual or regular ed. So with <clears throat> Sorry, good morning. So with districts facing enrollment declines, the rise in disruptive technologies like AI, chat GPT, all that good stuff, what are some best practices that districts are doing at the local level to try to retain teachers and try to teach kids differently? We, is your question specific to AI and how it's impacting? No, it's, just, it's more specific to what are some best practices that's being developed by the district to try to retain students, retain teachers. You know, there's a rise in school choice. That's 2025. I know there's going to be a lot more. Um, a lot of charter school networks are building while a lot of districts are downsizing. So what are some best practices that I guess we could see? Uh, yeah, some of, some of the best practices that you see across the state are uh, providing uh, uh, experiences for students in, in their areas of interest. And we have curricular, co-curricular uh, opportunities for students to engage in their schools, to be a part of their schools, to represent their community, their, their family, but also to gain uh, industry-based certifications. So just the, the, there's this smorgasbord of opportunities um, that are available to kids uh, depending on, on their interests. And our counselors are doing a much better job these days of uh, helping students see what all of their options are. Um, and and that's, how, that's how we compete from folklorico to conjunto to welding to uh, uh, athletics. Um, and we, we run the gamut on the opportunities in, in the area of athletics. Good. Oops. I can't sing that well. Anyway, good morning, and uh, I'm a 30-year volunteer in public education. I'm always grateful when I'm with frontline educators, speaking the truth about what's really going on in the classroom and casting light on hope and things to do for our kids. Thank you. Um, my questions. Um, has the STAR accountability system been a silver bullet? And... Just to. And are you familiar with the existing roadmap, roadmap that's been in Texas law since 1995 to empower teachers at the front line with their community to understand and serve the needs of students? And it's not just about, it's about serving their needs for their sake and uh, more than a test score and not just a test score. Two questions. Accountability system, a bullet, silver bullet, and do you know the roadmap? The answer to the first question is no. Yeah, I, like I said, there's no silver bullet in education. Um, it's just how are we leveraging things appropriately and correctly. And I think that the accountability system does provide a lot of opportunities there. It provides transparency to parents. It provides um, 
a, some roadmaps to best practices for districts and um, some incentives there. Um, but again, it has to be appropriately leveraged by the state and by district leaders um, in order to, for it to be fully realized. And I just don't know if we're there quite yet. I agree with that. It's uh, There's a place for assessment in instruction. Um, accountability is important. We, we all em embrace it. Um, but schools are not defined by a single letter rating. We are more than that. And I think that's where we as educators have to communicate to parents. We, he yes, here's our, our rating on accountability. This is what we're doing. But these are all the other experiences. These are all the other certifications and opportunities available to your, your children, thanks to the teachers who are championing that cause. But we also have to have accountability too, right? Like. It, it, Again, it's not an either or, it, we have to have both, right? And so without an accountability system, it can be, um, we, we can lose opportunities for students, so. Hi, my name is Susan Meredith and I have a company, Mentimorph. We have, we only financial game that you practice financial decisions in as little as 10 minutes per scenario. So financial education is my focus, which is math. But in Texas, it's a, it's a half credit, that has to be offered in economics. And the, the there are no standards that are consistent. They're over all kinds of different areas. And when are we going to be a state? There's 25 now that require financial education for graduation. So when are we going, and support the teachers who also probably need financial education. What is Texas gonna do about that? I don't know what Texas is going to do about it, but I can tell you that there's an art and science to teaching. Standards are part of the entire picture of instruction. Um, when we think about the role of the teacher, you know, I look at the students in my classroom, I look at the students across my campus, and I've become intimately aware about of their needs, of their, um, and I do my best, this is the art of teaching, to not take away from the basic curriculum, but to add to it in ways that add value and meaning to my, so we can't rely on legislation to fix every issue and close every gap in education. Some of it is relying on the expertise, the passion, the heart of teachers and the school and system leaders who know their school communities very well, who know um, beyond what, what's required and what's necessary for students beyond the curriculum, beyond the standards until legislation policy, all that catches up um, to what we've identified as our critical needs for our students. And I think this is a great place to add the importance of family engagement because what we teach in the classroom has to be reinforced at home. If we're teaching it one way in the classroom and kids are seeing different practices about how finances are handled at home, um, it, it, they're, they're going to be confused. Um, so a robust parental engagement uh, department that um, is also uh, bringing this uh, as a form of parental uh, education. Time for one more. Yes. So, uh, I just say, if well, I can help in any way, let me know. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, asking uh, how folks can help, this is our last question um, submitted online here. This person writes, it's great to have legislation and programs that address getting students to be ready for college or the workforce, but the funding doesn't align in a way to implement them well. I know there is a network of education foundation nonprofits set to up to support Texas public schools, but what can individual citizens do to help support the school districts advance their goals when they don't get funding from the state? Vote. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. I think uh, oftentimes people don't realize that your local elections are far more impactful on you and your family and your student than um, our larger federal uh, legislation or uh, elections. Um, so I think voting is really important. But I, um, you know, what we hear more and more from legislators is that they want to hear from the community. When um, there is session, they want to hear from their constituents. When they're talking about certain legislation, they want to hear from parents, they want to hear from students, they want to hear from educators. And oftentimes, they're the least likely to be the ones to show up and have those conversations. And so, if you want to support your district, not just vote, but be a voice for them. Um, because, you know, they can only do so much, but they need to hear from the community as a whole. And so the more that they can support them using their voice, um, the more we can, legislators can hear what the need is. I so agree with you. Advocacy is such, a, such an important piece of amplifying the voice of parents, amplifying the voices of children and, and of teachers. Thank you. 
Well, uh, a lot of great questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to all our panelists. I love this discussion. Thank you, everyone, joining us online. <laughs>